for about the next six minutes or so. We're going to run some slides with a quiz on it, and then we'll get back here in exactly six minutes, which should be uh, 6.44 by my watch. So see you all soon.
So welcome back from your stretch, everybody. Uh, it's really great to see you all. Um, we have a couple of little uh, things we want to share with you before Dr. Gregor joins us. First, I would love to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Friedman, who's waving up there. Right, Susan, you're waving, right? Oh. <laughs> She's, okay. Uh, Dr. Friedman is <clears throat> the Director of Clinical Research for the Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. She's also the Medical Director of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Group. And she's also a professor of medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center. So it's really exciting to have Susan here. Uh, she does a lot of publishing and is an expert on geriatrics. And she's about to tell us a little bit about lifestyle medicine. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ted. And what a wonderful um, lecture that was. That was really, I, I learned so much from it. And uh, I feel like I could watch it about 10 times and still get new things from it. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so lifestyle medicine is um, an approach, it's one of the newer branches of medicine and, and uh, uses what we call the pillars of, of lifestyle uh, with a plant, a whole food plant-based diet being sort of front and center, but also thinking about things like exercise and stress reduction and sleep, um, uh, et cetera, uh, to uh, try to reduce chronic disease. And uh, so we're gonna show a, a little video uh, about that. You know, with the onset of the pandemic, um, we, as did many people, uh, realized that, um, the, uh, that we have a new urgency in terms of addressing chronic disease. Uh, and so, um, uh, that is really our, our goal in this, this little video um, through the genius of uh, Bob Franke, uh, who does so many of our, our wonderful um, uh, technical things, uh, um, uh, says a little bit about uh, lifestyle medicine. So what is lifestyle medicine? It is a new field of medicine that helps patients reduce illness and improve health by focusing on nine pillars. These pillars are nutrition, physical activity, avoiding toxic substances, getting adequate sleep, managing stress, nurturing positive relationships, spending time outdoors, having a sense of meaning and purpose, and nurturing positive emotions and finding joy. So the take home point for this video is that many chronic diseases can be prevented, reduced in severity, and even reversed through lifestyle approaches. These changes can happen quite quickly. In one 15-day program where participants adopted a very low-fat, whole food plant-based diet, participants who were obese to start with lost over seven pounds. People with high blood pressure had a significant drop in their blood pressure. People with high cholesterol saw an average drop of 44 points. And people who started with high fasting blood sugar, which we see in diabetes, saw a drop of 28 points. This was in just 15 days. And the longer you stick with lifestyle changes, the more your health will be impacted. This picture shows the traditional approach to medicine. The doctor is at the helm and the patient is on the boat following the course that the doctor sets out. Lifestyle medicine flips this around. Here, the patient is at the helm, charting their course and taking the boat where they want. So to summarize, lifestyle medicine, the evidence-based practice of helping individuals and families adopt and sustain healthy behaviors that affect health, addresses the root causes of disease, and by doing this, can slow and sometimes even reverse the course of chronic illness. Addressing the pillars, including nutrition, physical activity, sleep, and stress reduction, can rapidly reduce risk from COVID-19. Be safe and thank you. So thank you, Susan, for that wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, and you know, now in the, uh, the age of COVID-19, in fact, we just had an article published uh, called Lifestyle Medicine in the Midst of a Pandemic. It's published in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. And basically all these chronic illnesses that have been uh, slowly taking, uh, taking their toll on people uh, are now rapidly taking their toll on people. So it's become um, a more of an urgent issue for people to really focus on these chronic illnesses. Um, the the uh, 
program, the, the two, 15 day program that was mentioned in that last video refers to our 15 day whole food plant-based jumpstart. Uh, and we'd like to share a video about that with you now. Since mid-March, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute has been dedicated to transforming our evidence-based, in-person, 15-day whole food plant-based jumpstart program into a virtual Zoom meeting-based format, which is now live. We still provide the same education and skills building components of our medically supervised program, optionally monitored by your doctor, providing all the information and support needed to adopt a whole food plant-based diet. This one change can achieve significant positive health results and even reverse the chronic conditions putting people at higher risk from COVID-19. All from the comfort of home. The program takes place over 18 days and seven Zoom meetings. We provide cooking demonstrations with sample menus, recipes and shopping lists, which could provide enough staples to last for up to two weeks. Our presentations introduce the relationships between food and health and how to look inside ourselves to make the changes we need to achieve success. Our Zoom meetings are personal, interactive, and fun. For doctors, contact us for information about introducing whole food plant-based nutrition to your patients. For patients, we will give you a letter to send to your provider, letting them know you are about to change your life. It's a win-win plan to survive and thrive in the age of coronavirus. Thank you. So thank you, Bob, for running that uh, wonderful video and for creating that terrific video. Uh, I'd just like to share um, some of the other programs that we, uh, that we run. Uh, we have a, a wonderful 10-week program called The Lift Project, which uh, every week uh, tackles a, um, uh, a different aspect of lifestyle medicine. And you can join by a Zoom call. Um, and um, uh, that's been going on now for several months. And people really, really enjoy that. Um, what else do we have? Well, we've been running CHIP programs for a long time, the Complete Health Improvement Program, uh, which has been around for over 30 years, is a terrific program. And uh, for people who want to make a long-term commitment, uh, that's a really uh, great way to provide support. You know, we developed the 15-day jumpstart because sometimes it's hard for people to make those long-term commitments. And we tell people about the jumpstart, look, you can do anything for two weeks. And they find out that they can and they really enjoy it. But then they ask, well, what can I do to continue this and get more support? So that's where jump, uh, Jumpstart comes in. Um, we have, uh, um, uh, in addition to this uh, uh, Lifestyle as Medicine lecture, we have another one coming up next Thursday with Dr. Milton Mills. And he'll be talking about um, how structural racism has actually uh, impacted the uh, the health of uh, many people of color. And um, he's a wonderful speaker. I think you'll really enjoy that. That event is available to enroll in now. It will be a similar format to this. And um, we would also ask if you, if you do like us to please uh, like us on social media. We'd really appreciate that. Um, if it's ready to roll, Bob, how about we uh, have a word from our sponsor? If you suffer from the side effects of pharmaceutical commercials, including nausea, headache, vomiting, frequent trips to the pharmacy, or an overdrawn bank account, then Wafipen may be right for you. Side effects for Wafipen may include curing type 2 diabetes, reversing heart disease, weight loss, cholesterol reduction, easing of stress, lower blood pressure, reflux abatement, erectile function, clothing size reduction, regular bowel movements, smiles, vacations, good health, and children with puppies. Ask your doctor if Wafipen is right for you. Whole foods, plant-based nutrition. Maybe our ancestors did know the secret to good health.
that video. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, creating that video for us. That was actually uh, Dr. Susan Friedman's um, brother who created that. Uh, very uh, creative guy. So um, we have a few minutes before Dr. Gregor joins us. And um, for those of you who are joining us a little bit late, I just want to remind you that uh, Dr. Gregor is the creator of um, nutritionfacts.org, which is a wonderful website. If you haven't used it before, I highly recommend it. Uh, he has a, a new video on a, a regular basis, almost once a week. And, um, you know, Dr. Gregor and I, as I said before, became um, vegan at the same time back in 1991. Uh, and that's when we read the work of Dr. Dean Ornish. He read it on his own. He actually went to Tufts Medical School, but he's a bit younger than I am. So we didn't know each other there. Oh, look, I see uh, Dr. Gregor. And it looks like he's possibly on uh, a treadmill. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, we first met Dr. Gregor in person a long, long time ago at the uh, Vegan Summer Fe Vegetarian Summer Fest in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and uh, used to make a, a big splash at the Kids Center, um, which uh, we've, we won't go into that, but it was a lot of fun. So Dr. Gregor, welcome. It's so great to see you. How's everything going in Rochester? Well, it's great. I'm sitting out here. The sun is going down, but I'm out here in my gazebo and enjoying a beautiful evening. And, you know, um, one of the things you talk about is the, the benefits of green tea, right? And yeah. one, of the, one of the questions is three cups of green tea while staying uh, low caffeine or no caffeine, what do I do? Can I get decaffeinated green tea or how do I get the same benefit? So you can get decaf green tea. We don't, uh, we don't know if it'll offer the same benefits. Um, the decaffeination process removes some of the uh, phytonutrients. You can't just remove the caffeine. Um, but the question is, we don't know which phytonutrients are, are uh, cause the beneficial effects, but we do know that uh, um, uh, three cups of tea, an initial three cups of tea a day, it decreases uh, all cause, associated with an all cause mortality decrease of about 24%. That's two extra years of life. Um, and this is with green or black tea, though uh, uh, green seemed to work better than black. Uh, so I do really encourage people to develop um, a taste for tea. I, that's what I have right here. I have some green chai right here. And, um, and, uh, and, but if the only way you're going to be able to do this, some people are really sensitive to caffeine. Um, mm -hmm. I encourage people not to do any kind of caffeine after about 4 p.m. Uh, most people's liver should be able to kind of um, rid it by the time of bedtime. But some people are really sensitive. I mean, in which case, decaf green tea would be better than no green tea at all. Got it. Uh, are there any other uh, herbal teas that you would recommend to people? Oh, uh, well, so, uh, so green tea is not an herbal tea, but of the herbal teas, which is basically right. defined as any other plant other than the tea plant, um, mm -hmm. there's you know, about 28,000 uh, plants out there. Um, and uh, so best of which is probably hibiscus. Um, uh, hibiscus tea, also known as Jamaica tea or red tea, um, uh, significant improvement in blood pressure comparable to uh, ACE inhibitor drug, um, though actually can have the same uh, uh, side effects and cause chronic coughing. Um, and if that's the case, you should stop drinking your hibiscus tea. Right. And isn't hibiscus tea quite acid and a little bit tough on your teeth? Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, so any sour, also called sour tea, anything sour, mm -hmm. whether you're eating citrus um, or drinking hibiscus tea, you always want to rinse your mouth out with water afterwards um, just to clear the natural, natural acids off your uh, um, teeth so you don't hurt your enamel. The worst thing you can do is brush your teeth immediately after eating something acidic. You say, oh, well, I know about that acid you know, causing dental erosion. So after my pineapple, I'm going to scrub all that acid away. The problem is you're scrubbing your enamel away when it's in that softened state. So we want to wait at least a half an hour afterwards um, uh, uh, before uh, brushing your teeth. And what we can do immediately, though, is just rinse our mouth out with water just to clear the acids off the surface of our teeth. Um, uh, there was just a meta-analysis published of all the studies on oral health of plant-based eaters. And we have significantly less um, tooth decay, less uh, so-called dental caries or cavities, better periodontal health, better gum health, but more dental erosion because we're eating more fruit. Um, uh, and so we just need to rinse our mouths out with water after the fruit and we should be good to go. 
Got it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, what about getting vitamin K2 on a whole food plant-based, no oil diet? Is that uh, Yeah. That so uh, vitamin K2 is produced by our good gut bacteria from K1, which is found in dark green leafy vegetables. So eat your greens and your gut bugs will turn K1 into K2 and you're all set. But you don't get any unless you eat your greens. Okay. And does that have anything to do with uh, oil or no oil? Nothing to do with oil. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, having some source of fat with your greens helps the carotenoid phytonutrient absorption. Uh, but uh, okay. yeah, no, it doesn't have to do with the K2. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, we got a question here about autism. Uh, the question is, can you talk a little bit about broccoli and its effects on some types of autism? I love that question. What an amazing study. Um, yeah, so what they did is they randomized. Now, a, a, a limitation of the studies, they only used boys. Um, autism is more com, uh, common in boys, but uh, autistic boys of a certain age range randomized to um, uh, broccoli sprouts. Um, so broccoli sprouts are a concentrated source of sulforaphane, which is this uh, compound in the cruciferous vegetable family, which is why I encourage people to eat cruciferous vegetables every day. And uh, it was based on weight. Um, and so everyone got a little different dose. It came out, I forget, something like a half a cup of, of, uh, of uh, broccoli sprouts a day worth. We'd say they're kind of spicy. So that's a lot of broccoli sprouts, but they saw significant improvement in, um, in uh, uh, positive autism symptoms, something you don't see with drugs. There's some things you can do with drugs, you can calm people down, uh, but you can't actually affect the, the social um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, distortions that come along with autism. But what was the first uh, intervention shown to actually benefit? It was broccoli, or more specifically broccoli sprouts. Um, uh, and it was uh, randomized, uh, so placebo control, they, the placebo was alfalfa sprouts. So those randomized alfalfa sprouts didn't get any benefit. Um, uh, though if they really knew their stuff, they could tell that they were in the alfalfa group rather than the broccoli group. But um, yeah, remarkable study, amazing that it got published and actually saw um, uh, uh, significant benefits. We don't know long-term, we don't know if it works in other age groups or genders, but uh, you know, can't hurt, eat your broccoli sprouts. Love it. So there's a difference between broccoli sprouts and broccoli? Is that what you're saying? Well, so uh, you would have to eat a lot of broccoli to get the same kind of sulforaphane. This is assuming that sulforaphane is the active ingredient that's, um, that, uh, and there are, there's in vitro evidence suggesting that sulforaphane is indeed what we're looking for um, in terms mm -hmm. of countering some of the hallmarks of autism. Um, uh, and uh, I forget the conversion, but it, you know, you'd have, you know, like eating a pound of broccoli a day is a lot of broccoli, particularly for sure. younger folks. And so you can just get it more concentrated. However, better than uh, you uh, you think, well, why don't I just take a broccoli sprout pill or a capsule? It turns out um, uh, that when uh, that's actually been looked at, when they've looked at the, at the broccoli um, uh, and sulforaphane uh, 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 supplements on the market, they have not actually found to have the active compound, which is very unstable. It's hard to it's not shelf stable. So you really do have to eat the real thing. Uh, you can grow it yourself um, for just a few pennies a day on your windowsill in a mason jar. You can make all the broccoli sprouts you want. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk about green smoothies versus eating whole vegetables. Uh, actually, in your video, you mentioned a little bit about what happens to uh, what are the, the, the um, the, the parts of the plants that have that have the, the membranes that have um, the chlorophyll on them. I forget what you call them. The, the what uh, on them? Th the thylacates or thyla. Oh, thylacoids. Thylacoids. Thank you. Uh, right, I right. love I love me right. some thylacoids. Exactly. Okay. So um, maybe, I don't want to uh, <clears throat> change your answer here, but the question really was really about what about green smoothies versus uh, eating the whole vegetables. Um, so the only concern with green smoothies is the rate of absorption. Um, we want to drink our green smoothie at the rate at which we would eat those whole fruits and vegetables. So if you make a big green smoothie and you just packed your blender filled with fruits and vegetables, you look at that and be like, wow, if I was actually going to eat those, oh my God, it would take me you know, 45 minutes or an hour and a half or whatever. That's the time by which you should sip mm -hmm. your green smoothie. So the way to do that 
is you make your smoothie thick. Add some ground flax seeds. Uh, use a thin straw. So you really have to suck it out. And so, I mean, just, yeah, uh, you know, thick smoothies, thin straw, and it'll just take you a while. And uh, that's, uh, then you get the best of both worlds. And you'll be getting exercise while you do it, right? So, oh, right, so right. You'll get, right. You get, <laughs> you, you'll be, you bulk well, up like, your cheeks. Right, exactly. But what about the idea that the uh, blades in a blender can break up some of those things that your teeth would never be, break down? Well, that's actually beneficial, right? So there's some things um, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, with uh, something like um, uh, nuts and nut butters, um, mm -hmm. When you, uh, nut butters, we actually absorb more of the fat, more of the calories because the average particle size of a nut butter is actually smaller than the diameter of a cell. So they break open all those cells, release all that oil, um, and so you get the full caloric complement. Whereas the average um, a particle size of chewed nuts, have people chew nuts and before they swallow them, they just spit them out, is actually, it contains uh, tens of thousands of little fat filled cells which are, uh, which are surrounded by fiber. Um, and never actually digested. You actually never get those calories. You just kind of you just kind of flush them out the other end. And so uh, mm -hmm. it's about ten percent fewer calories than the exact same amount of almonds um, eaten as almonds versus eaten as almond butter. And so that could be seen as a benefit for people trying to lose weight that you're actually malabsorbing. You're actually not absorbing all the nutrition. When it comes to greens, though. Dark green leafy vegetables, the healthiest foods on the planet. We wanted all of it. We want to get in all those cell walls. And there's no way we could chew that good to release all that nutrition. And so that's where a blender, a green smoothie comes in. Or making pesto. There's lots of um, recipes where, where greens are blended up. Um, and then you really maximize your absorption of all those uh, wonderful goodies. Mm -hmm. Well, what about keeping your uh, microbiome happy? If you're um, breaking down those cell walls and maybe you're, there's left, less left for your microbiome. What about oh, that? Oh, that's a great point. The reason why we do, we would rather use um, whole intact grains versus powdered grains versus, uh, you know, uh, so I encourage people to deflower their diet, try not to eat um, flour products with the exception of pasta, is because we want, um, uh, we, uh, so, you know, when we eat those nuts as opposed to nut butters, um, well, all that, all that nutrition it only gets released down in our colon when our good gut bugs get a chance to eat it and uh, provide kind of a bounty of prebiotic goodness. And so when you eat oat groats, for example, as opposed to instant oats, um, you create more, no matter how well you think you're chewing, you're, there's these clumps that are just not going to, they're going to make it down to your colon. And that's mm -hmm. the pre that's the fiber and resistant starch um, and just regular starch that gets trapped. It goes all the way down. Um, and you get uh, 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 much more of the short chain fatty acids like butyrate, they absorb in your system, have benefits on, uh, on brain health and Im immune health and inflammation on down the list. And so um, uh, in terms of providing prebiotic goodies, um, that's why whole grains and uh, whole legumes, um, as opposed to blended, so it's, it's actually healthier for your gut microbiome to eat chickpeas rather than hummus, um, uh, but it's because we're transporting starch down to the gut. There's very little starch in dark green leafy vegetables. Um, and so there's nothing, there's nothing that we're not transporting down to our good bugs. Got it. So there's a difference in terms of smoothies, uh, greens versus the grains and legumes. Correct. Got it. Good. Okay. Um, we'll change gears here a little bit. Somebody asked, is it true that gout is caused by meat in the diet? So, oh, so certainly, yeah, so gout can eat, there, there's two main things in our diet that are increasing levels of uric acid, which is what crystallizes in the joints and causes gout. One is meat and the other is added sugars, like high fructose corn syrup and table sugar. And so people that, you know, so it's like a fast food diet, swigging down um, with, a, with, you know, a sugar sweetened beverage after eating a burger. I mean, that's, just, that's, the, that's the setup. For, um, uh, for hyperuricemia, high uric acid levels in the blood, which can increase your risk for gout. And so um, it's not just the meat, but also these added sugars as well that can help decrease one's risk. And if one does have a history of gout, also just drinking lots of water and constantly um, diluting um, the amount of, it's kind of like a, 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 a rock crystal, kind of like a, 
like a, like a rock candy kind of crystallization where you have a super saturated solution of sugar, you put a string in, you get the crystals, same thing. It's a super saturated solution of uric acid and all it takes is, is something to kind of tip over and, and, and start those crystals. So we just want to drink, 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 drink before bed. If you're not getting up to pee, you are not drinking enough for your gout. Okay, words of wisdom there. Uh, what about people who are trying to avoid bloating or abdominal pain when they adopt a high fiber whole food plant-based diet? Yeah, um, so it depends on your microbiome. So some people are able to switch with no problems whatsoever, but um, there's others who, you know, after slathering their intestinal lining with milkshakes and cheeseburgers their whole lives, they just don't have the microbial machinery to deal um, with all these prebiotic goodies that are coming down. And so it's all about just starting slow, a slow transition. You want to get to the point where you have good bugs, these fiber feeders um, in your colon. Um, and there are a few down there starving, desperate for you to eat some garnish next to your steak or something. And finally, when you do start eating those, um, um, those good foods, you can, they'll fruitful and multiply and, they, and the steak eating bugs will die off and you'll have a much healthier microbiome, but that can take a while. And so some people have to go really slow. Um, I remember having patients where literally it was like, okay, today I want you to eat a spoonful of chickpeas. All right. And then tomorrow, like, and it was really, they had to move that slow to build up um, uh, their, their, their microbiome. Um, but uh, it's worth the, but it's worth however long the transition is to build up um, uh, a healthy gut flora. Good. Thank you for that. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, apparently, ophthalmologists who are, have patients with macular degeneration recommend eggs because of the content of lutein and zeaxanthine. And I don't yeah. not familiar with that myself. Yeah, so the, these retinal pigments, uh, lutein, zeaxanthin, the egg industry has this whole ad campaign uh, targeting ophthalmologists, encouraging them to, uh, mm. to get these retinal pigments um, uh, into their patients, but it turns out, so I did a video about this. It's just remarkable that, uh, um, that I mean, the, the, these are nutrients found in greens. And the only reason that the, the chickens have it is they're, they're, um, there's some in their feed. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I forget what it is, but like, you know, a half cup of spinach has as much of these uh, lutein zeaxanthin as, you know, uh, you know, three dozen eggs or something like that. And it's just off the chest, like a single spoonful of greens has more than all the eggs you could possibly want. Um, people mm -hmm. not, should, should not be eating egg yolks. They should be eating their greens. Um, and we actually have data where they actually randomize people to greens or egg yolks, like significantly better um, retinal pigment. You, you can do uh, non-invasive uh, measures of uh, a macular pigment, and you can show how you can ramp that up um, eating greens much easier than egg yolks. And then you have to deal with a cholesterol issue and sure, excess sure. choline, et cetera. Interesting. So you're saying that the egg industry has targeted a group of physicians? Oh, and, and, and similarly, the egg industry has targeted um, um, the, uh, the ob gyns with choline, that your, your children are going to be born brain damaged if they're not getting enough choline. Um, uh, and, I mean, and so they make up this choline deficiency epidemic when actually oh, we're getting too much choline, creating this trimethylamine oxidized by liver to TMAO, which is associated with all sorts of terrible things. And if you actually measure the breast milk of you know, vegans to omnivores, ovalective vegetarian, they all have the same level of choline in the breast milk. Your body will make it if it needs to, um, mm -hmm. such that, so there's no decrement in choline, even, even in people not eating a single egg. So you touched there a little bit on TMAO. Uh, could you comment on that and its relationship to carnitine and choline? Yeah, so um, there's uh, these two compounds, carnitine and choline, that are converted by your bad bugs, by bad bugs, and you've gotten to something called trimethylamine, um, which is then uh, converted by your liver into this compound called trimethylamine and oxide, which is uh, a compound associated with heart failure and kidney failure and atherosclerosis and cardiac events, premature death, on down the list. Um, and so where does carnitine come from? It comes from red meat uh, predominantly, and, but also from uh, um, uh, sports drinks, like uh, energy drinks. Often we'll have carnitine on there. So you can have someone who thinks they're, you know, uh, you know they're, they're, they should have low TMAO levels because they're um, uh, otherwise eating healthy, but you can get some in, in um, energy drinks. 
and the other is choline found concentrated in eggs, um, but also lecithin. Um, so um, some people take lecithin supplements to lower their cholesterol. I mean, that's just packed with choline. They could get a spike in TMAO as if they were eating egg yolks. Um, and uh, so I would encourage people not to take lecithin supplements, um, and not to eat eggs, not to eat um, red meat from the, for the TMAO perspective. And choline is also found in seafood and uh, poultry as well. Got it. Interesting. All right, here's a whole other area. This has to do with fluoride in the water, toothpaste, or mouthwash. Should we be avoiding that because it might be killing off uh, uh, oral bacterial biome? And also, what about, I'm going to, as long as you're going to talk about that, what about uh, Listerine or something that doesn't have fluorine but is a, a, a antiseptic? Oh, yeah. I uh, have a whole new uh, video series coming up. Uh, talking about the oral microbiome, it's really um, interesting, particularly these um, uh, what are called nitrate reducing bacteria on your tongue. The way you know the athletes uh, you know are doping with like beet juice, eating arugula, eating spinach before an event, and because of the nitric oxide production from the vegetable, um, uh, the nitrate rich vegetables, um, they have all sorts of benefits in terms of ergogenic benefits in terms of better utilization of oxygen. Um, uh, less, uh, uh, greater time to exhaustion, all sorts of performance enhancing benefits. This also helps um, non-athletes improve their blood pressure and all sorts of other benefits. But uh, critical in this link is this um, enterosalivary uh, loop by which you swallow um, uh, your kale and arugula and beets, beetroots and beet greens. Um, and the nitrates get absorbed into your system, and then your body concentrates it out of your bloodstream into your salivary glands. Why does it do that? It does that because it knows you have these good bugs on your tongue that take the nitrate and can convert it into, your, uh, into another compound, which allows your body to actually create the nitric oxide. Um, and so you need to eat your vegetables, and you need to have these specific tongue bacteria, but you take people, and you give them an antiseptic mouthwash, which kills off the bugs in their mouth, and all of a sudden their blood pressure goes up. Why? Because they're unable to use um, those vegetables to their full advantage. Um, and so that's why we really need to be careful about our, uh, about our tongue microbiome. And so it's interesting, um, I, uh, someone asked me about tongue scraping. Um, this process by which, you know, these like, little plastic and metal things that scrape your tongue, um, and, and it's used uh, predominantly for halitosis, for bad breath. Um, but I was thinking to myself, well, might that be a potential adverse effect? I mean, the reason it helps with bad breath, it helps uh, pull uh, this kind of tongue coating, which is a combination of bacteria. And, um, and so if it reduces bacteria levels such that it helps bad breath, might it be reducing those good bacteria too? And, it and so I looked into it because I was concerned that tongue scraping might um, you know, uh, impair people's ability to use vegetables to improve their artery function. And it turns out the exact opposite. Tongue scraping actually improves your, um, uh, your, uh, your nitrate-reducing bacteria such that um, tongue scrapers actually suffer more when they stop eating vegetables um, because they have so much better um, uh, uh, oral, so, so much such a better oral microbiome and between that and the fact that tongue scraping increases salt sensitivity on your tongue, you drip tomato soup before and after tongue scraping, actually tastes saltier, the exact same soup after tongue scraping than before, so it can help people cut down on salt. So between that and the nitrate, I was like, all right, that's it. I got to do some videos and encourage people to scrape their tongues. And you're not on the uh, payroll of the tongue scraping The tongue industry. scraping industry? <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll make that clear. Uh, I actually uh, I have to go back and rephrase that question because the original question, and it's my fault, the original question was about fluoride in toothpaste oh. and mouthwash. So um, what does fluoride do? Um, uh, so uh, uh, fluoride is counted by uh, the CDC as one of the greatest public health innovations over the last century um, uh, because, by, and we're talking about fluoridation of water, um, uh, it enabled, it, uh, I mean, if you look back, it's remarkable. Like if you look back at World War I cons conscriptees and the amount, count the amount of missing teeth, young, healthy people missing, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the number of teeth, I forget the statistics, but it was just remarkable that young, healthy people missing all their teeth. 
Um, and, but that was kind of a pre-fluoride era um, and it's had a remarkable benefit, particularly for underserved communities, for people that can't afford good dentists and can't go get, uh, you know, can't go get all this fancy dental work. Um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, enable them, so it's kind of a, an affirmative action way to improve people's um, health. Um, and uh, um, I haven't seen any data on affecting microbiome in a, a negative way. Sure. Yeah, and you wouldn't think so. I mean, it's not an antiseptic. So, um, right. Interesting. Um, wow, that was fascinating. So when, if people are going to use, um, are you telling, telling people they should not use uh, antiseptic type mouthwashes or is there a certain time of right. day that's better? Oh, and then I mean, alcohol tongue... mouthwash are worse than both worlds right. because you actually get, you, you, you create this acetaldehyde, this, this carcinogenic compound from the uh, from the alcohol and increase your risk of oral cancer. So no alcohol containing, no antiseptic mouthwashes. So wait a second, what if I suffer from bad breath? What am I gonna do? What you do is a zinc chloride mouthwash. Zinc chloride does not affect the bacteria in your mouth. Um, what it does is it just gloms on to the sulfur, the volatile surf, sulfur compounds, um, the hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg gas, um, and uh, there's, uh, there's a bunch of other VSCs and, and makes them insoluble, takes them um, so they can't gas out. Um, and then you just swallow them. And so cuts down on, on bad breath. Zinc chloride, zinc gluconate doesn't work as good, but a zinc chloride mouthwash without alcohol, non-antiseptic is the way to go if you have bad breath, along with good oral hygiene um, and tongue and tongue cleaning doesn't have to be tongue scraping. You can brush your tongue as well. Interesting. Okay, here's one of my favorite questions. This has to do with artificial sweeteners, and also if you could combine that with the uh, the non-caloric natural sweeteners, so something like stevia. Are those good for you, or what do you think? Oh, um, uh, well, so. Um, uh, the pro, so they're, uh, they're each are different compounds with different effects. Um, the, uh, there was great promise for Splenda, so-called sucralose, because it was not absorbed within the body. And the company likes to brag about the fact that some, unlike something like aspartame, which actually is absorbed into your bloodstream, um, there stays pretty much within the confines of the gut wall. Um, but what they didn't think of, well, hmm, well, in that case, it makes it all the way down to the gut. It might it have um, negative effects in the microbiome, and indeed it appears too. So um, uh, something like we want to stay away from sucralose because it ne adversely affects our microbiome. Um, uh, but uh, in general, these, uh, these low calorie sweeteners, artificial or not. So uh, they looked at monk fruit, uh, they looked at stevia, as well as aspartame, sucralose, and the saccharin, um, and found that uh, there's actually no benefit of blood sugar control averaged over the day. Um, uh, that even though obviously at the meal at which they were eating a, a caloric and non-caloric sweetener, you'd have more um, uh, blood sugars in response to, you know, eating a couple uh, tablespoons of sugar um, versus something with no calories. Later in the day, you actually had greater blood sugar spikes to the lunch and supper in those who were eating the, in the non-sugar group, such that it averaged out, they actually had no benefit um, uh, throughout the day. Um, and so uh, um, uh, I would uh, encourage people to instead change their hyper sweet palate by um, uh, reducing their intake of these, these artificially sweetened um, and hyper sweet foods such that whole natural healthy food tastes delicious, right? The ripest peach in the world tastes sour after a bowl of Fruit Loops. And that's because of the, your, your, the industry has so deadened your palate. And by eating really sweet things like artificial sweeteners, low calorie sweeteners, you maintain that really high level where nothing really tastes sweet enough unless it's um, you know, sweetened at this kind of industrial level. What we want to get to a point is that natural whole healthy foods taste delicious. Um, and so um, eating a, a whole food plant-based diet without these sweeteners, all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, just a sweet potato with a little cinnamon sprinkle on it is not just okay, but it's craveably good, sweet, delicious, but it doesn't start out that way. Um, you know, uh, mo you know, most of us couldn't imagine eating, you know, uh, you know, corn on the cob without butter, without salt, but it actually can be delicious if 
um, you just have to, you know, you just have to, uh, to let your palate adapt over a, f a few weeks. Um, so you don't have this hyper sweet, hyper fatty, hyper salty palate and also normal healthy foods taste good. And then you get the best of both worlds. Wait a second, taste delicious and you get to live longer. That's the way to do it. Um, and, but you're not going to get there um, if you keep uh, maintaining that high level of uh, salt or sugar in your diet or the, those tastes. Okay. Very interesting. And yeah, we get that question a lot from our patients. Um, and uh, I usually, I'm proud to say I get pretty much the same answer. So um, what, uh, what about protein powder from plants? Is it a healthy food? Uh, no, just like, so basically uh, protein powder is like the table sugar, the carbohydrate kingdom, or the refined oil of the fat kingdom, where you get the protein, you get the macronutrients, but you're losing all that other nutrition. Why would you do that? Um, you might as well get, so instead of eating pea protein, why not eat legumes instead? And then you get all the fiber and all the other benefits. Um, and, uh, and the, you know, this, you know the, we are in uh, no lack of protein. So even people eating strictly plant-based diets uh, tend to get about twice the estimated average requirement uh, for protein. Really only need about 0.8 grams per healthy kilogram of body weight a day. That may actually be beneficial trying to get down to that level in terms of longevity, something that I will be dealing with in depth in my next book, How Not to Age, out December 2022. Ah, very exciting. You heard it here first. Um, so here's an interesting question. It has to do with behavior change. What techniques can people use to change their habits and stick to the changes? Environment, environment, environment. You need to change your environment. You cannot rely on white-knuckling it for willpower. You can do that for a short term. But if you want to stick to it long term, you really, you know, uh, you want to stop eating junk food, get junk food out of the house, right? Um, if you get hungry enough, you will eat that apple, but you're not going to eat that apple if there's some cookies hiding somewhere behind that apple. Um, and yes, you can you, you force yourself to not eat that cookie, but eventually um, you're, you're going to cookie crumble. So um, only keep good food in the house. And now for those of you who say, well, wait a second, I live in a household where other people don't share my values. Um, and they want to have junk in the house. Um, hopefully, they would be supportive enough of you wanting you to be around for a while that they would um, uh, clean up your food environment. But if not, stick it in a pla one of those bins with a padlock or something. Lock it up. Let them, right? Right? Just you should not have access to bad food. And if you don't have right. access to bad food, you're not going to eat bad food. Control your environment. That's the best way to eat healthy. Right, right. You know, our, our goal is to help to, to change the culture eventually. And uh, so someday when we're talking about a hopeful plant-based diet, people are going to say, what are you talking about? It's, that's it. We're, we're already there, right? It's, exactly. We make right. It, you know, and there's just healthy food everywhere. Right, exactly. exactly. I love that. And, yeah. And the Blue Zones people say, you know, let's help make the, uh, the, the, the healthy choice the easy choice. Exactly. So, right, right. Um, what was an interesting question here? What did I, I had it a second ago. Uh, I'm only oh, got okay. a minute left, unfortunately. Uh, all right, well, would you have any final thoughts for us? Oh, uh, just uh, I'm uh, missing everybody and wish I was there in person, looking forward to the world opening back up and me being able to come back and uh, stay safe, everyone. And we are 40 days away. Go to vote.org to make sure you're registered. And if you're not, you can register right on the site in 20 states. Um, uh, we are coming up on the next election. Okay, I love that advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Greger. It was great to see you tonight. And um, I'm sure I, uh, everybody is out in the, the audience is applauding you. So uh, Yay. Thank, you, thank you. Hey, thank you so much. We hope Bye to see everybody. you again Bye-bye. Take care, Michael. So. Um, that's it, everybody. Um, Bob, do we have any more, uh, let's see, announcements here? Uh, I think we got it all. I don't think I got a chance to introduce our staff. So you met Dr. Susan Friedman. You saw my wife there, Carol Barnett. She's with the little kitten. Bob, uh, Frankie, who's been behind that blue uh, uh, globe uh, all evening. Uh, if you want to reveal yourself, or maybe you're not dressed for it, I don't know. And Beth Garver, uh, she's our uh, director of, uh, of um, uh, what is it? It's um, uh, strategic development. So uh, <laughs> she, she revealed herself. So anyway, uh, thanks everybody. And oh, there's Bob. 
Thank you, uh, Bob. And don't forget, we have an, on, uh, next Thursday, we have Dr. Milton, uh, Milton Mills speaking. And if you're interested in uh, participating in one of our 15-day Whole Food Plant-Based Jump Starts, please take a look at our website. We recommend it to your friends. It's working really, really well. Uh, you heard about it in Dr. Friedman's video. So again, thank you all and have a wonderful night.